Um, my name is Alan Friedman. I'm from the U.S. Department of Commerce, and I'm lucky in that I don't actually have to do much talking in this. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what commerce has been doing, and the answer is we've been having really smart people who are dedicated about the security community uh, do a lot of hard work to make progress on a fairly old problem in InfoSec, vulnerability disclosure. Uh, so my corner of the Department of Commerce, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, has convened an open and consensus-driven multi-stakeholder process focusing on vulnerability disclosure. Um, and it's been about running for about nine months, and we've had brilliant folks from the security research community, from the vendor community, from the intermediaries who help promote that and who've done a lot of work uh, initially. And we're going to hear from the three working groups that have been very active over the past nine months, one on awareness and adoption, another on safety and disclosure, and finally on multi-party disclosure. Um, so this work that you're about to see is not from the Department of Commerce. It is from the stakeholders who believe that this is an important issue. Uh, at the end of this talk, we're going to have a fairly brief talk, and the goal really is to have some discussion, to hear feedback, so that you can share your perspectives on what we're missing and what we can do better to bring about some positive change. So very briefly, the Department of Commerce likes it when markets work. Uh, online trust is a huge priority for our secretary because without trust in the systems that we use, uh, there's not going to be innovation, there's not going to be adoption. Markets will fail. And sometimes, to fix a market failure, you need active regulation. You need to weigh in with the big stick of government. Uh, we believe that there are actually often lighter touches. So we want to bring together those who care about this issue and say, how can we have collaboration around vulnerability disclosure? Now, this isn't a new debate. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to find some way of saying there are standards out there. People have been thinking about this issue for a long time. How can we actually uh, make some progress. So rather than trying to write new standards or even produce best practices, we're trying to come up with some principles of what we can do <laughs> to, of what we can do so that researchers who want to continue to engage know how to engage, organizations who are new to this issue understand what's at stake and what the path forward is. And the underlying approach is there is no one size fits all. Uh, that every organization is going to have something that's unique to them, and different researchers, each bug is at the end of the day going to be unique and need to be handled differently. So what are the broad issues that we can do? So the process has basically involved a lot of talking. It has involved some very tedious meetings and even more tedious phone calls. So the people who've been engaged uh, we really have to thank them for all the hard work. You're going to see the working group chairs, but behind them, as they will say, a lot of very smart people were dedicated to this. So first, we will talk about the awareness and adoption group. And what's noteworthy about this work is that I think everyone in this process has said at the end of the day, raising awareness and driving adoption of existing good practices really is the most important thing and relates to all the other work that's going on in vulnerability disclosure. Jen. Sorry, Jen Ellis from Rapid7 and Amanda Craig from Microsoft. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so the big learning there was that Alan does all the slides from now on. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, as Alan said, I'm Jen Ellis. Um, I uh, run community and public affairs at Rapid7, so uh, I head up public engagement and also think about how we can support the security community, you guys a little more, uh, which is where this falls in. I'm Amanda Craig from Microsoft, and I work on cybersecurity policy issues. Hey! <laughs> Round of applause for Mr. Josh Corbin. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. OK. So um, why, why this? Why did we do all of this? Um, and, and is it just because we wanted to sit around and come by our um, I think, you know, ultimately, as Alan said, there's been a lot of work that's gone into talking about vulnerability disclosure and handling in the past 20 years. Um, lots of incredibly smart people have worked on this problem, and there are very well-established uh, best practices for both sides of the equation, for, for researchers and for, um, for, for vendors. Uh, in fact, there are ISOs, there are two of them, 
However, there's not very much adoption. And so the, the reality is that the problem continues. And that if we can't solve adoption, everything else that we do is just academic. It's just um, a lot of sitting around talking to people to death, as Alan said. So for us, that was why we really wanted to focus on the adoption and awareness problem, um, is to make the theoretical um, applied and actually try and see some change occur. Um, that, was, that was a big kind of focus for us. Um, so what we're gonna to talk to you about today is surveys. Ooh, surveys. <laughs> so sexy. There'd be even less of you in the room if you'd known that this is what we were talking about. <laughs> um, so we, uh, we, it's kind of funny. We, we were talking at the beginning and there were lots of people in the rooms. Oh, you see, people are leaving. Surveys, laugh! Um, so at the beginning we were talking, there were lots of different voices in the room from all different sort of sides of the, the uh, conversation. And there were lots of people using the kind of dialogue you often hear in this discussion. Lots of assumptions being made. And we had this sort of like very side conversation, Amanda and I, one day about how you know, if we're gonna get meaningful about coming up with ideas of, for adoption, which is what we were focused on, then it would be really good if we could get to the bottom of what was really going on with the surveys and like really understand the truth behind it. And so the idea of the surveys initially was something that we were gonna just basically put together in a week and get out and it was gonna be like a really quick thing. That's not really what happened. <laughs> um, and so they became this like huge thing and it ended up not being one survey, it was multiple surveys. You wanna talk about the, who we surveyed and why? Yeah, so you know, the, Jen has mentioned some, one of the reasons why we initially came up upon this idea of a survey was to challenge our assumptions and sort of um, you know, challenge everyone that's been part of this conversation for a decade or more to, to rethink you know, have the norms changed but there are also you know, new players in this space. There are the, the IoT folks that are newly technology providers, automakers, aviation companies, medical device manufacturers, and so on, that are newly dealing with this issue of vulnerability disclosure. Um, and so we wanted to also capture you know, with what's going on in their world. Um, and, and we did. We were hoping that we would get some real data from these surveys that would help us identify ways to drive greater awareness and adoption. And so you know, we thought about different communities that we would survey, very obvious to survey the technology providers and operators and the security researchers as the two very central players to this. We also did consider doing a consumer survey. And the reasoning behind that was that you know, if consumers care about security, that of course helps to drive adoption of security practices like having a vulnerability disclosure policy in place um, for vendors. So we were interested in knowing you know, to what extent this is a consumer issue or a user issue. We ultimately decided to not do a, a user survey. Um, Jen's gonna talk in a few minutes about all of the sort of method methodology issues that we faced in, in disseminating the survey and, and the bias that we likely captured um, in surveying the, the internet the way that we did. Um, but all of those issues were really, really exacerbated in the case of a user survey. Um, because it was just going to be really difficult. We're, this survey the, and the dissemination of the surveys was just done by the Awareness and Adoption Working Group as part of this NTA process. We didn't really have any funding or any expertise in, in surveying. And so you know, we, were, we were just going to be doing uh, what we could to promote the surveys. And so we felt that the responses that we would get would just have incredible bias. It would either be totally random from users or it would be people that were already really, really interested in this topic and that would, that would be the reason why they would notice this and respond to the survey. So we ultimately didn't do that. What did we do, Amanda? <laughs> we did do the, the technology provider and operator or vendor and the security researcher survey. We tried to make these surveys really short, really simple. I think they were both like nine questions. Um, you can see, you know, in general, we were just looking to figure out what, what, are you, what are you doing and why? What is your general expectation? Uh, what is your behavior? What is your rationale for that behavior? Um, in the process of researching, in the process of disclosing or receiving and handling a vulnerability. Just wanna highlight that you know, these questions, the fact that they were so simple, we think helped to, uh, us get, gather a lot of responses, but the, the, the flip side of that is that you know, there were some limitations in the questions. So for instance, you know, if we were trying to um, 
uh, understand that there would be a vast array of experiences that researchers would have and we want to capture all of them. A lot of times we uh, enabled mul multiple responses to any single question, which then made the data hard to interpret. For instance, we asked a question about how interaction with a vendor was and we had 55% of researchers say that it, they had really frustrating experiences in com communicating with a vendor, and we had 60% say that they had you know, a really productive conversation <laughs> with a vendor. So you can see those numbers don't quite work out, and, and we, but we took what we could from, from the responses that we received. So as Amanda said, we surveyed the internet, um, and we have been mocked for a huge amount. Uh, the nice thing is when you survey the internet, the entire internet mocks you for surveying the internet. <laughs> Um, and they also helpfully provide feedback on your survey uh, after it's already out in the public domain. And it, I mean, it's fine because data scientists tell me that there is no validity to the survey anyway, so we could have just started changing it. Um, but we chose not to do that because it seemed kind of skeezy. Um, so we had a lot of learnings in the process. You know, the, the reality is, like as Amanda said, we were kind of highly limited. Uh, you are all playing spot the meme now, aren't you? Shit. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so uh, we were sort of highly limited in that this is, um, you know, it's a volunteer organization, it's not owned by any one sort of entity, and so we were limited in kind of what we could do on the surveying. We wanted something that was free and open and easy, so uh, we did go the sort of survey monkey route, and I think if I was advising somebody who wanted to do this as more of an academic exercise, I would tell them not to do that, uh, but you would have to pour a lot of money into it, honestly. Um, and we had a huge number of learnings along the way. One of the things that we found out is the vendor survey didn't really work for the open source community, and that was a little heartbreaking because we really wanted to capture them. Um, we also had used some of uh, SurveyMonkey's kind of standard, um, like, yeah, demographic splits. And for the uh, verticals for the vendor one, that was really dumb because one of the categories was technology. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Obviously, a lot of people identified that way. Interestingly, not everyone did. Um, so there were definitely some, some, pretty, some pretty huge learnings for us in this process. But we did try to, um, I would say, like push beyond just putting it out there and dumping it and leaving it. And we knew that that was never going to be effective as a thing to do anyway. So we got really active with trying to get media to promote it, trying to get people we knew that had um, wide followers to promote it. We reached out to ISACs. Amanda did a phenomenal job of talking to a lot of vertical alliances, a lot of vertical ISACs, and getting their members to do it. And we could see that coming through as the results were coming through. Oh, is this me again? Shit. Um, so how did we do? Um, so on the researcher survey, we had 414 responses. Now, again, we surveyed the internet, so 414 may not sound like a particularly high number, but when we went into it, we were very hesitant about what we would really get in terms of response. And the stretch goal that we had set ourselves was 250 for each survey. So we were really delighted by 414 responses. And the data actually did show kind of a, a pretty decent variety in who we got in terms of um, whether they were people who were uh, doing research as part of their job and that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, largest, um, the largest percentage of geographic uh, split for both surveys was definitely the US, which was not super surprising since the NTIA is a US government um, entity. However, we did see some other uh, governments pay some interest in it and, and some people kind of promoting it internationally. So for the researchers, we got 210 US responses. And then you'll see um, the splits here. So half of the people who responded uh, listed themselves as sort of quote unquote independent researchers. Um, it was nice, the thing that I thought was awesome was that we actually got people who were accidental finders responding. Those were the people we thought would be super hard to reach. We didn't think that like the way that we were disseminating it, we would easily find those people. So it was good that like people who don't consider themselves to be professional researchers took the survey, and that data is, I think, very valuable. Um, and then in terms of the tools, we had asked this question about what kinds of um, tools people use. I'm not sure the tools is really the right word for some of these things. Um, and this question, again, was one that I think kind of became a little crazy and bloated over time. 
uh, when we were preparing it, and so ended up covering a sort of weird mismatch of things. Um, but you can see, I'm not going to talk through all the stats because they're right on the screen in front of you, so you can read them. And thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, now getting into the actual uh, data that we got from the researcher survey. Uh, we asked a, a question about how researchers disclose, um, uh, what's their first action in disclosure, and then also a separate question about what their expectations are in disclosing and how that influences their behavior. So with the, for the first question, the response we got back is what's captured in the graph, which is like 67% dis disclosed to the vendor, um, something like 10 and 13-ish percent uh, disclosed to a, a bug bounty provider, or to a coordinating organization like CERT CC. And then just 4% approximately either just don't disclose or um, go public in full disclosure. Um, so we were you know, excited to see that what we kind of consider coordinated vulnerability disclosure was captured in that circle was the sort of predominant norm. But then um, <coughs> we, sorry. <laughs> We did look at you know, what, how you know, expectations change behavior, and we saw that when um, a researcher submits a, a vulnerability to a vendor, and then in doing so they also provide a time frame, and then that time frame is not met by the vendor, uh, then, then they will go public. So 24-ish percent of researchers said that they had, had, they had done that. Around 7% said that they, um, the vendor provided a timeline when they disclosed, and then the vendor didn't meet that time frame, and so then they went public. But about 8% said that the vendor provided a time frame when they disclosed, the vendor did not meet that time frame, um, and they considered, but ultimately did not go public. And I think it's just coincidence that it looks as if the researchers were giving us the finger. No. <laughs> um, so, Unsurprisingly, um, well, I thought it was unsurprising, uh, but then I work in communications. People said that communication is valued. <laughs> Shockingly, people like to know what's going on and feel like they've been heard. Um, so we had 95% said that they expected notification when the issue was resolved, which seems kind of reasonable. 68% um, said that they would really kind of like regular updates. That seems like a pretty decent, reasonable thing so that they know that something's happening. Um, and 57% uh, actually kind of went further and said they'd actually like to be involved in testing the fix to make sure that it really is, is kosher and works. Um, and, and that was kind of interesting in that there were researchers who were like, we're super happy to stay involved in the process. We want to partner with the vendor. We're not just like, hey, this shit's on fire and then running away screaming, um, which is cool. Like, we appreciate that about researchers. And then... Um, 84% in a similar vein said, yeah, totally happy to answer questions from vendors, want to stay engaged, want to stay part of the process. Um, <clears throat> and then trying to look at the rest of it. Oh, never mind, I can't get down there. Um, so yeah, so communication was really important. People really valued that. They expected the vendor to be open and transparent with them. And apparently I've now done something to the slide. There we go. Yes, I don't computer. Thanks, Josh. Oh, is this me again? God damn it, how did I get so many slides? Um, so this is, yeah, this is actually, the, this, there's a reason this one's me, because I kind of talk about this issue all the time. Um, so we hear a lot about the chilling effect of um, specifically the CFA and the DMCA, and specifically with both of those, the fact that they have civil action in them, which means that a lot of vendors use them to threaten researchers when they're afraid of disclosures. So we hear a lot about that, but it's always a little hard to know whether that's something that is a little bit sort of fuddy and overhyped. Um, it's not. 64% said that fear of legal repercussions is a serious, serious issue for them, and it, it seems as if it is something that um, makes them question whether or not to disclose to the vendor. <laughs> the last 26% responded from prison. <laughs> it's not true, by the way. <laughs> For the recording, it's not true. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah. Um, and then we also had 24% said that they are afraid of stumbling into confidential information. 
Um, only 24%, the others were like, whatever. <laughs> Sounds great, let's see what I can find. Um, that's why I do this shit. 31% uh, said that they are afraid that exploits will be used nefariously. I don't know if we had the word nefariously in the survey, but I hope we did. <laughs> uh, another finding um, in asking what does a, what a, a, a researcher expects in return for disclosing a vulnerability was that it's not just about the money. You know, consistent with what Jen was saying about communication, we had 70% say that they expected um, to hear from the vendor after they submitted a report. 53% said that they expected um, to have some recognition. Uh, only, I think, 20% said they expected nothing. Uh, and then 15% said they expected a monetary reward. And you can kind of see by those numbers and how they add up that this was one of the, the answers that you could check many boxes. So you weren't limited in saying, you know, if you wanted one thing, you couldn't want another. And still only 15% said they, wanted a, they expected a monetary reward. Wanted is a different story probably, but expected. <laughs> Just out of interest, how many people are surprised by that? Show of hands. I, like, this was one of the biggest surprises for me. I was really surprised that, because we hear so much dialogue in the community about, you know, how people are selling vulnerabilities because there's a market for it now, and if we don't have bug bounties, then we're not going to be comparable and all that kind of stuff. And the reality is only 15% care about that, which is kind of awesome, by the way. Like, that means that this community is doing this stuff for much higher purpose, and that is fantastic. I love you guys. You are amazing. <clears throat> Fortunately, Amanda's talking through the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so this, we're now moving to the, the survey of the technology providers and operators or the vendors. So our, our demographic, are we? No, no, it's good. Okay. Uh, demographic information, as you can see, the, there was the issue that of the survey monkey self-populated and uh, technology being um, a huge Fancy uh, that. <laughs> percentage of our respondents. So that may be slightly skewed um, because we did try to reach these newer kind of technology providers in the... But I will say, a quick anecdote on this. Um, one of the meetings that we had, um, I had, I asked a question about technology providers in the room and their attitude on something and asked for a show of hands, as I am wont to do. And there were a whole bunch of people who didn't put their hands up. And I knew that they were from what I would count as technology providers. And so doing the thing that Alan tells us not to do, I put them on the spot and was like, did you not answer that because you don't, you can't like publicly answer it, or do you just not identify as a technology provider? And they said we don't identify as technology providers, and that was to me super interesting. These were automakers, and they like totally had this this that we're car makers. That's what we do. That's that's how we've self-identified for a long time. So even though now we're dealing with things that have millions of lines of code in them, we don't consider ourselves to be te quote unquote technology providers. So this this actually. As much as it seems kind of like really obvious we would get this result, it was also slightly surprising to us. So just like the, the researcher survey, predominantly our responses were coming from the US. We did get some you know, 10 to 15-ish responses from UK, Germany, uh, Japan, Canada, I think. Um, and then the other thing to highlight here is the divide between large and small organizations. Um, we had, if you, if you can imagine, a thousand uh, employees as the Dividing mark, um, there are, I think, what is it, 160 respondents were smaller than that, 125 were larger. But the, our respondents, there was heavily weighted towards having, um, you know, being really large or really small. So having more than 10,000 employees or less than, fewer than 100 employees. Um, and Alan? Sure, just very briefly on the, the math side of things, uh, one of the ways broke down uh, the respondents uh, using clustering analysis due to the wonderful Bob Rudis uh, is to say, hey, listen, we noticed that roughly half of the participants seem to be uh, mature. They've thought about vulnerability disclosure and roughly and, and have implemented a number of different practices for different reasons. And then roughly half were not mature. They didn't have many practices. So we can learn something about, you know, what does a mature organization look like versus an immature organization when it comes to vulnerability disclosure? Thank you, Alan. And, and one other thing to highlight there is that we didn't necessarily, in the respondents to our survey, see a split among large or small organizations being overwhelmingly mature or immature. Recognizing that likely outside of the context of our survey and what we captured, there might be more of a difference, but there were a lot of small organizations that still kind of met this maturity 
model criteria. So one of the, the, the things that we captured is what are mature organizations doing? So we were, had a kind of a bar of 75% or higher for, for what we were wanting to highlight. Having a dedicated monitor, monitored path um, for investigating, triaging, and resolving vulnerabilities. Having uh, a process for providing end users with alerts. Uh, providing researchers recognition um, and, vulnerabil and having vulnerability reports inform your secur security development lifecycle were all really um, have lots of organizations um, were acted consistent with those best practices versus for the immature organizations or the less mature organizations. For each of these, they were between uh, 8 to 12 percent following these behaviors. Okay, so uh, why are they doing this stuff, the ones that are mature, why? Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, so basically, uh, the biggest thing is always gonna be that your customers tell you to. Uh, you know, people, people vote with their feet, and if you feel like your customers are not gonna buy, you are going to change your behavior. So, um, in the more mature bucket, uh, we had 79% say that their customers cared about this issue. Whereas in the less mature, 9%. They were kind of like, ah, whatevs. <laughs> um, and we could, you know, theorize who falls into which bucket, but we won't, that's for in the bar later. Um, <laughs> the, other, the other big ones were, I mean, certainly like corporate social responsibility, there was a, it was a little woollier on that, but not, not super low. Um, so the more mature was 65%, and I actually can't see the number for the lower one. Um, and for the, uh, for the, the, it reduced the cost, which we thought would be a really big thing. Um, the more mature, it was just a little over half, 50, 54%. So <clears throat> we asked them which best practices they were looking at, um, and we gave them three options. So one, they were deriving their best practices internally. Two, uh, we actually gave them multiple options, but these were the top ones. Um, so one, they were de deriving them internally. Two, they were looking at the ISOs. And three, they were looking at what other companies are doing. Does anyone want to guess which stat goes with which thing? So other companies, anyone want to shout out a stat? 49. Wow. Uh, no, n the one that none of you <laughs> get, 59% said they were looking at other companies. Um, ISOs. 49, absolutely which was a little surprising to us, um, honestly, and says a lot about the availability in the, and the awareness around the ISOs. And then 76% were deriving their practices, just looking internally at what made sense for their business, which is actually kind of awesome. Um, and I always have an Archer slide, uh, so we have this. It's actually, we're gonna be doing this bit after you've heard from the others, but this is where you kind of are going to help us brainstorm ideas for driving adoption. Thank you very much. Sorry, this was a little... And thank you, Amanda and Jen. And now Josh Corman, who shouldn't be a stranger to many of you, uh, has uh, offered us that slide's coming later. Um, some the work that's been going on on the Safety and Disclosure Working Group. And thank you, Josh, for coming and running an entire track on your own, but still come up here to share what your working group has been focusing on.
don't expect that he can afford 15 years for safety critical incident. But maybe it's going to take one or two. So what I tried to put on the table early is that this is where bits and bytes meet flesh and blood, and where the consequences of failure will be measured in, not in credit cards or records loss, but in human lives, in national GDP, prices of confidence in key markets that are necessary for our way of life. It may even lead to a compromise of our civil liberties and our values as a nation or as a global community. So we tried to assert, and people seem to go with it, that safety critical industries could be a superset of the requirements and constraints on designing a journey to go from crawl to walk to run. And if you're playing Josh Corman bingo, that's the center square. Um, but the crawl, walk, run idea is what we decided to do, and, and, and the, the cavalry has worked with Tesla, with GM, with others to get them on their journey towards coordinated vulnerability disclosure. It's our belief that if you can create a high trust, high collaboration zone, then you'll have better outcomes. And essentially, the simplest way I put this is, do you have a beware of dog sign for the researchers, or do you have a, uh, a welcome mat? And the crawl idea was, what's a minimum viable product that fits on one page that can be used as a template so you can sell it to your general counsel without a whole lot of attached surface and redlining and entropy, such that uh, maybe you could get started on your journey. And one of the things we've learned from these folks is if you can never retract you can always expand, but you can't ever retract. So if you offer cash, you can't get rid of it. If you have a narrow scope, you can't make it more narrow. Um, not really. So the safety critical working groups, people seem to agree that maybe it's not a beautiful indie snowflake, but if you can solve for forever days, an unpatchable vulnerability in a piece of industrial controls equipment, if you can solve for that, then it may also be useful for non-safety critical industries. And we've had some consternation over this. We've done some duplicative work with Art, who hates us for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I think that Jen and uh, Amanda's survey work has been very corroborative to some of our assumptions, very much so. So um, this is a little bit frustrating for me to do a collaborative process because I have this burning platform idea. Not that I can't collaborate, but um, one of the things I tried to remind the group, and I will remind this group, is whether you have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program or not, thanks to the DMCA ex exception, DMCA exceptions coming in October, which is two months from now, uh, you're going to get a surge or a tidal wave of vulnerabilities. And, and the data in the survey shows that, what was it, 64% yes. are afraid of legal reprisal. When that fear is reduced, you will see submissions. And without betraying any confidences, the rumor is that in the first 48 hours of GM's program, with no, board, with no vulnerability prize or not, they got over 100 submissions. And I asked them, you know, if you got a lot of submissions, I won't say how many, how many of those do you think were found in the last 48 hours? And that was really the key question, because you can't find an automotive bug in 48 hours. These were known, but people were afraid to share. So um, the same is true for a lot of these folks that simply reduced the barrier. So what we wanted to do was show some sort of, um, again, minimum viable product. And this is a template that we've used um, with others outside of the collaborative process. And I was really trying to add some urgency that even though this process may take a while and will take some time to get the survey back, we wanted to cause some sort of action prior to October 1st. Because if you want to build capacity and muscles before the flood, this is the time to do something. So um, we basically made a really, really ugly Word doc that got a lot of fighting. But I essentially said this should fit on one page. And there's, there originally were four blocks. But do a brand promise. Do an initial program scope, keyword initial, that we will not take legal action in unambiguous terms, and then the mechanisms uh, for submission and ongoing communication, and then we've had to add this last one more recently because some things have changed, uh, submission preferences. So it doesn't affect your legal posture, but the kind of bugs you will and won't prioritize or accept. Um, so really quickly, um, the brand promise idea is safety is super important to us, and in addition to all the wonderful things we already do with our own staff and with third-party contractors, we want to cast as wide a net as possible and invite participation of willing allies in a whole community approach to try to um, find bugs and be safer sooner together, that kind of thing. So this is a marketing thing that can get you, a lot of people look at this as a legal thing or an engineering contract. This is very much a brand a reinforcement thing. People were really pleased to see GM's program. People were very pleased to see Johnson & Johnson's program. So uh, this reassures to your customers that you care about this and take it seriously. The initial program scope, um, because these are safety critical industries who have no idea how many bugs are gonna get submitted to them, they don't know if they can internally triage them, we've encouraged an explicit scope reduction. 
Don't ask for bugs on all the things you've ever made. Maybe pick the most recent model here. Maybe just pick one make and model of your car. Uh, that way it becomes a throttling mechanism, which you can expand after your pilot. No one judged the Pentagon for having a 20-day pilot. They did a pilot, and based on what they learned, they're going to do another phase in all likelihood. So the idea is start narrow, start on something that's newer and more modern perhaps, something that you feel the engineering teams can triage, and based on the received bugs and the quality of those received bugs, you can always expand scope over time. And by stating initial, you won't be judged for this is a finished product against something like a Microsoft. You'll be judged as we're beginning our journey. Um, there's also implicit scope, which I will skip for now. There's the most, one of the most important parts is we will not take legal action if, and while I don't have Archer slides, apparently I have my cousin Pete's slides. Um, so if you, uh, if you, there's some pretty good exemplars here, but basically we've seen people have as, as few as four bullets of, as long as you follow these three things, these four things, these six things, I think GM had eight things, as long as they're affirmative, unambiguous, um, clear people, you're basically having a covenant with researchers that if I'm willing to admit to these things, then I know I won't hear any fear of reprisal. And these ones, what we're finding, should be fairly immutable and evergreen. If they change frequently, people won't trust the program. The researchers won't trust the program. Expectation management is 90% of any human thing you ever do. So this is really how do you submit, what are the minimum expectations for submission, and what are the expectations for initial uh, acknowledgement of receipt and ongoing communication cadence. And then rather than prescribing this, we've outlined that the negotiation of the ongoing cadence should be on a per bug, per relationship basis, because uh, not all bugs are created equal. But um, you know, the ISO standard does leave, say, within seven business days, as you can see. And then submissions and preferences and priorities. We wanted to separate, separate uh, something that's added some confusion. Some of these programs on day one only had four sections, and then as their engineers got flooded, they started adding exception after exception after exception. And the researchers just stopped dead in their tracks because they didn't know were these exceptions to the legal posture or were these things that we just don't want to hear about cross-site scripting. And there's a bunch of things we're tackling as well about how do you do change management and version control because these things should change and grow over time as you learn more. But we also don't want a moving goalpost when we're talking about something like a legal posture. And we've had a lot of discussion uh, and we haven't come up with perfect solutions but we have seen how folks like Microsoft and others have tried to dampen the risk. So to that end, I think many of those things uh, were alluded to without slides. So scope, one of the less obvious, so let me just do 30 seconds on this. Uh, we cut it from the document because we had to debate over it, but it's actually proving to be very necessary <laughs> after the survey. I basically say white hats have five key motivations, uh, and they all start with a P. There's protectors, who want to make the world a safer place. There's puzzlers, who do it for challenge and curiosity. There's prestige, who do it to win a white jacket or to give a keynote at DEF CON. There's profit who do it for money, and there's protests who do it for or against some political cause or ideological cause. If you fail to include a cash reward, it's not a failure at all. I'm, I'm deliberately and overtly encouraging that the first boarding disclosure program does not have a bounty attached to it. And one of the reasons for that is you will only attract the subset of researchers who are protectors and puzzlers. They won't give you arbitrary conference deadlines. They won't quibble over how big or small the cash prize is. And when you're ready to, you can always layer them in. So we've also encouraged the lack of uh, monetary reward. In fact, one of the coolest rewards that anybody gets is things like this challenge coin from Tesla or things like a t-shirt from the Netherlands that says, I hacked my government and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. People prize that t-shirt more than they would prize a small cash reward that's well below their day rate for the kind of work they put into it. So at least for the safety critical industries, we've considered, um, we've strongly encouraged the lack of one. You'll notice that GM was not criticized for not having a bug bounty program, but FCA did get a little bit of criticism for having too small of one. Uh, and we're in this learning curve together and we're trying to figure it out. But I think this working group has been very intense, very candid, and the data you're seeing from Jen and Amanda's work is corroborative. So with that, I'm gonna run away right now. Um, but if what we really want is more feedback. We've had some researcher feedback, we've had some safety critical industry feedback, and we've actually had people already publish theirs, even though it's not done. Um, but for right now, I have to run. So find me, um, join our working group calls. We have a draft. It can always be better. And the problems we need the most help on are how do you change management? Thanks. Thank you, Josh. And now we'll hear from Art Manning from CERT, who has literally been at the center of this debate for uh, 15 years now? Personally, 15 years. Organizationally, 28, I think. Why we count? 
It's a hard problem. I mean, come on. It's a, the problem is it's a people problem, not a technology problem. So you can't solve it with a technology or a protocol. So uh, <clears throat> uh, Art Manion Cert Coordination Center, <clears throat> I'm going to represent the work of a bunch of people um, who are part of the multi-party disclosure subgroup of the NTIA process. Um, this got merged with uh, first form of incident response and secure, whatever it says up here. Form of incident response and security teams has a special interest group with a very similar bit of work going on. A lot of the same people doing two things. People were not happy with that. Merged, reduced duplication, increased efficiency. Um, the work continues under the, uh, under the special interest group within FIRST. Um, we get some nice administrative support from FIRST, like WebExy stuff, and, and uh, we actually have a person taking notes, so that's very nice. Um, why, why look at coordinated vulnerability disclosure uh, for multi-party? Um, why coordinated disclosure at all? Vulnerabilities exist. Attackers attack with them, against them. Uh, we're kind of, sort of sure, think we're sure that disclosure is a good idea and, and is, is an effective defense. That's something we might be challenging coming up. Um, there's some general agreement on the model. You find a bug, you report it, you wait, uh, and the vendor fixes it, and you disclose. And after that, um, people disagree pretty quickly on how long do you wait, do you disclose, when do you disclose, how much information. So framework might be four boxes, but the details go all over the place. <clears throat> so why coordinated disclosure? Why multi-party disclosure? Um, more vendors means more complexity. Uh, I asked my more math-informed colleagues. They said it was not exponential growth, but it is greater than linear growth when you add people to the, to the mix. Keeping secrets gets very hard after the second person finds out about something. When it's the 73rd or 125th vendor, that just gets harder and harder. Managing comms gets very difficult, uh, and uh, expectations and policies get start to, start to get, uh, become in conflict after you yeah, add a lot of people. Um, we're seeing a lot of more shared code format protocols these days, different supply chain relationships than you know, Unix and Windows used to have years back. Josh was up talking about safety industries. Um, the way cars are made in the US is a supply chain, well, it was new to me uh, and does not fit existing models of um, how software gets into things. So that's interesting. Uh, this was also covered. There are, there are vendors, as I still refer to them, who make things. They think they're car manufacturers. They are technology manufacturers, but they don't think of themselves as that yet. So GM is not new to the planet. GM is new to disclosure. Um, the process we went through to try to come up with something useful was not a survey, uh, but sort of a uh, conceptually structured thinking process. Uh, we are going to try to derive something useful from what, what, our real, what the group's real world experiences are. So uh, different types of coordination and disclosure cases, um, variants that come up from those cases, because the exception is the rule in lots of places, especially here. Uh, you are always going to have a variant. It's very rare you get a coordinating, coordination disclosure case that goes smoothly and perfectly. Um, for each variant, what caused it? How could you prevent it in the future? How do you respond to it? Uh, lists and lists of things. Cluster those lists, see what sort of things rise to the top, and that from there you, you get your practices. And potentially further from there, we're going to get principles out of this thing. Um, here's a very simple example. So a, a very clean, a relatively clean case, multi-party coordinated disclosure is going on. Uh, variant four, a vendor leaks early. Um, what's the cause? They send something in plain text. Prevention is encryption. Response is cat's out of the bag, everybody run. So uh, guess what? Someone just, Josh just said this, right? It's a, this is a human sort of organizational problem. Missed expectations, huge, huge thing. Um, publish and follow your policy. At least tell other people what's going on. Uh, doesn't mean you agree, it means other people know what to expect from you or what you expect from them, which is at least a starting point. Um, some common terms or common reference might help, but we're not asking everyone to agree necessarily on one CVD policy that works. Um, we're getting an interesting example coming out here, uh, uh, an emerging thing. Uh, OpenSSL is a good example of this. It is so difficult to pick who to tell first. They basically have an announcement saying there's something coming next week, and then on next week on whatever day, everyone finds out at the same time I think. <clears throat> uh, communication is huge. Uh, frequent is probably better. Um, people feeling they know they're being talked to, they're part of the thing, keeps them involved and happy, uh, less likely to, to leak something. Um, if the finder does not reach the vendor, you have no coordination going on. 
if the fix information does not reach the users, you have no fixing going on, and the whole thing is a waste of time if those things don't happen. So comms is cl clear. You can get help. Coordination centers can help sometimes. Uh, we actually don't want to be involved if we're not needed because we have other things to do. But um, uh, multi-party is a case where often having a neutral, somewhat more objective third party who's actually paid to do all that communications mess um, can be useful. More practices uh, have, have relationships, know your supply chain up and down, you know your peers horizontally, know other stakeholders. This means outreach to researchers, your suppliers. You want to know when somebody upstream put a new version of libpng in the thing that's in your dashboard. Um, you want them to tell you that so you know what you need to do or not. Uh, incentive, uh, incentives, we've already covered this in previous slides, but chilling effects are a thing. Uh, be cognizant of those. I'm not telling you what to do, but be aware that it exists. They exist. Um, you, can do, you, can, you can do various incentivization rewards, reward structures. Um, an idea that groups thrown around is to exclude repeat offenders. If you always leak, if you always uh, are not playing with the social group, Common social creature behavior is you're, you're out of the group. We don't tell you next time. Uh, keep clicking here. Uh, whatever you do during a multi-party thing is going to be multiplied. Be careful with what you do, especially disclosing sorts of things. Provide good information. We like CVE or something to tie things together. We like machine-readable information. And lastly, I'm going to throw up, we have, uh, the group has not worked through these principles slides. Um, so take them with a, they're, they're very much in draft state, but uh, harm reduction, being prepared, uh, you have some responsibility to inform others. If you buy into this whole defensive disclosure is a good thing in the first place, you may not agree in the first place, in which case these principles won't apply, but if you follow that, these are the kinds of things we think are sort of over well, overarching sort of human goals that you might want to uh, um, uh, consider. Feedback is happening now, feedback happens is ongoing. We expect to have a draft of the MPD, multi-party disclosure document, out for public comment. Uh, you can join the first SIG. You don't have to be a member of first to join and be part of our, uh, I think, twice a month calls at this point and contribute that way. Obviously, if there's an open comment period, you can contribute that way. That's my email address if you have other questions. And thank you. So I want to thank Art, and you can stay up here, because now is the time where there were some questions earlier, um, but we can do some quick takeaways from the survey earlier uh, and the awareness and adoption group. And really, one of the reasons that we wanted to come out here is because while there has been active research or participation of people who care about security, not just because they make stuff, but because they're genuinely interested in security, we wanted to make sure that we heard from the security community. Uh, and so uh, there are the three working groups that you've heard from, and here's a refresher of uh, the takeaways on the, uh, the awareness and adoption group of what they found. It's behind us. Uh, and so if you have thoughts, and we can revisit some of the specific questions, of how can we reach safety organizations and organizations that are new to it and build templates and get them aware of the crawl stage, uh, how can we coordinate across uh, multiple parties and, and what are some of the basic frameworks for that and and of course uh, how do we just raise overall awareness uh, so I'm going to stand here and try to moderate and Jen's gonna swear at the end uh, I mean not at the end all the way through <laughs> but with but, an, a, an yes. accent that makes it fun, like nice it's fun yeah. it's it makes cute. it nice yeah, it makes with it an nice. accent it makes it nice there's a tweet yeah. for you right there <laughs> Uh, so please, uh, so I know there was a question earlier, but I'm going to return the mic uh, yeah, I was gonna say, out here. You've got that mic. Uh -huh. Okay. Alan. So first of all, I have to do the legal disclaimer. My opinion is not my company's, um, mostly because my regulator is sitting two seats down for me. <laughs> <laughs> So I work for a very large pharma company that I am trying to convince to get involved in this. So I have some feedback and I have a challenge for Alan and I think for Jen as well. So Is it not swearing? Because that's fucking impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know you guys are doing great work, okay? So I've been following what you're doing and it's fantastic and amazing. However, you guys need more of an ego. You need to publicize what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, John, no. <laughs> no. It, it, it may not be a problem for some individuals, but for as, as a working group, genuinely, you know, serious feedback, you're not selling it enough, okay? 
you guys need a website, you need to do more engagement. I know that NTIA doesn't have money to put behind it, but we, you need to find some way for me to be able to go to my VPs and my business side people and say, I want us as a very large corporation that could support this to get involved in this. So, the, oh, so the challenge yeah. for you, particularly, um, I do a lot of work with ICANN as well, which is also an <laughs> NTIA thing. You know my boss then. Yeah, yeah I'm good friends with Larry. Um, so they do amazing stuff on multi-stakeholder engagement. And I think there's really learnings that could come from that side over into what you guys are doing. And then just from the community involvement, just looking at the slides and on the feedback and the people that you got, I think we need more people in my position. So more healthcare vendors, more automotive manufacturers, more people that are part of that whole mix of companies that were manufacturing or were healthcare, but we are now technology providers, which I totally agree with. Yeah. We need to work out as a group, how do we get those people involved? And that comes back then to the first thing is, how do we sell this as something, not just as a, this impacts the security and technology people within a company, but this is something that the business needs to work on. And I want to just call out as well, because I didn't get a chance at the, the I Am The Cavalry thing yesterday. What Suzanne has done with the stuff with the FDA has quite literally revolutionized how security is being spoken about here, within here. my yeah. industry. Here, here. So I, I, ha I have a 30 second anecdote that I want to say. Please. I've spent 10 years in many pharma companies trying to push this discussion that we're having here. Six weeks ago, I got an email from my vice president of reg affairs and our director of QA asking me what we were doing in this place. <laughs> Not the other way around. That's how much it's changed in the last, say, six months to a year. Yeah. So th this is where we are now. And I also think that the interactions between these two groups are how we're going to move forward as a security community. And that's really important that we take this and grab it now and set the path for the next, particularly for my industry, we work slowly, the next 10 years. And that's Thank starting you. now. I really appreciate it. That is fantastic feedback. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let the, the experts respond, uh, but I'm just going to say that the final step as we draft uh, this process is to say, OK, how do we take the document that has been built with the input of those of you who really know what you're talking about and how do we get broader adoption? Now, in some cases, we're lucky because we are the Department of Commerce and because it is a voluntary approach, we can get industry to wave it at their regulators who aren't as friendly as Suzanne. And, and the Chamber of Commerce, for example, hates regulation, loves this approach. Um, and any advice that you guys have in terms of how we can take this and, and build it so that it's something that is not just uh, in the tech community, but outside and global, because it is always hard for, especially in the US government, to remember that we are not the entire world. <laughs> uh, so uh, so you know, how do we take this uh, global variable? But um, firstly, Suzanne, was your session recorded yesterday? Do you know? It was. So I would just say, for yeah. any of you who were not able to catch Suzanne's session, that you should check out the video. It was really, really awesome. And um, she has done incredible work at the FDA and um, and they are certainly to my knowledge the regulatory body that is most ahead with um, adopting cybersecurity norms for their their vertical um, and it is super inspiring to see honestly so you should definitely check out her talk um, in terms of what you're saying one of the things that Amanda and I have talked about a fair amount is at some point NTIA has to move on um, you know, the, for them to continue forever is not the best use of ta taxpayers' dollars. <laughs> and as the uh, example of, represent of taxation with no representation, I, I want Alan to be doing other things. Um, so I, I think, you know, at some point, there has to be a moment where we decide that this can stand on its own two feet without NTIA. And so, you know, something that Amanda and I have talked about is for adoption, you know, as I said at the beginning when we first start talking about the surveys. Our whole thing was about coming up with ways to drive adoption. It wasn't about coming up with surveys. The surveys were a means to an end. And they ended up taking so much time that now we're at this point where 
we're kind of like, we hope that this doesn't lose momentum. We hope that people don't feel like the surveys were it and it's done. And then they're just like, oh, well, someone else will figure out adoption and move on. Like, this is what it's all for. So now we have to solve that problem. And we have to think about how do the people who are interested in this topic continue to work together. And I agree with you that there needs to be some kind of centralizing point that people can focus on. I think the challenge is when you have shared ownership, how you do that and how you pull that together, particularly when you don't have a lot of resources behind it. So it's definitely something that we have to think about. I, I agree with you completely on that front, but it's, it is going to be a challenge. <clears throat> and I have a question back. You know, in a way, I'm guessing that it's probably all of the above. But you mentioned that your VP of Regulatory Affairs is someone who is coming to you. But I, ideally, it would be from a, 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 like the, a different business perspective coming to you and saying, for our reputation or for the value of our product or so on, yeah. we are also concerned and engaged. So my question back is, you know, what is the way to reach that VP? Is it you know, going and, and talking about others in your industry, like peers that are doing this well and what they're gaining from it? Is it just more publicity? Like what are, what are the mechanisms that are going to be meaningful for, for those VPs? We're going we're gonna to mic you for those watching at home. Thank you. So two points from my industry. We are pretty much all year zero companies on this. Um, so we're probably not the best example of that. I will say one thing, though. My VP of Regulatory Affairs would not be talking about this if our CEO and board and everything were not asking questions about it. It's just not on her radar. It's just not there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is being talked about at that level. And for us, that's because of FDA. But from, ac from across the industry, um, this comes back to, I think we're still in the security researchers and technologists talking about this. And the comms piece that we need to move on, be it when we take ownership of it ourselves, is how are we showing the business value in this? And not in you know return on investments or anything else. It's, we need to keep really simple messaging to you know C-level people that here's the impact that this will have. And like a company like Microsoft is probably a great example of that, that it has really been ingrained into company culture. And you know, you guys probably have experiences from 10, 15 years ago of when you started that process and how you solved that. And that's something that we need to then take over and say, okay, this community thing that started with the NTIA but is now evolving into a, a, a community-based set of resources or working group that's going on, how do you sell that to your company? How do, how do I, as a security person within a large corporation, say, no longer do I want to try and get involved in this as just me. I want my company to support this. I want my company to send me to the meetings. I want them to put 10, 15% of my time to that. And to that, I have to sell a business case for it, not a technologist's case. And that's the, the messaging that would need to change. The work can stay the same, but the messaging would have to tweak a little. Yeah, just I'll throw in real quickly, uh, since the car guy's not around. Um, uh, in the U.S., DOT and NHTSA are, there's, there's signs of progress there as well. They're not as far along, I'd say, as the FDA if I had to somehow measure them. But there's some, you know, the, the, the vehicle safety regulators are looking into it in the U.S. So that's a good sign as well. So. And I will also add that, you know, ART has been doing this for a very long time. And if we are busy at the Department of Commerce on cybersecurity, CERT is really busy right now. And the fact that they're engaging in this, I think, is for me a signal that says that uh, at very least they want to make sure that we don't ruin it. But I think that it's going to be uh, something that they can then take to the broader community uh, together with you know, organizations like the Chamber of Commerce. And, and we're also talking to you know, the auto trade groups uh, who like to communicate and be able to speak as one voice to their regulator to say, hey, we're moving forward on this. So think about what we're already doing before you go and impose something that may be quite dangerous because early discussion that we saw coming out of the auto sector, um, you know, there was never anything very official, but there were some signs that said that they were proposing you know, treating security flaws the same way you treat uh, some of the existing safety flaws, um, which are huge events for a company. Uh, and they're, they make a company not want to learn about it and not want to affirmatively engage. So there was discussion about uh, the disagreement between the industry on when you report something to the vendor or company and then when you disclose it. 
And we've seen a lot of back and forth between Google and Microsoft on this very matter. So Google has that policy of you have exactly 90 days, and then Microsoft has the policy of we only patch on patch Tuesdays. Do you think there should be more give between one or the other, such as Microsoft shouldn't be so specific on patching, or Google shouldn't be so stringent on 90 days, or do you think that they need to find some sort of better middle ground? What's CERT's policy on this, Alan? <coughs> so uh, it's a fun debate, certainly. Um, in a sense, I don't know how super useful it is. So, so actually, so here's, here's a, actually, to take your example, I'm pretty sure if I remember after that whole thing happened, Google modified their policy, so they now have an extra, they get a two week kick at the end. So that's an example of, we have a policy, we have a policy, you each knew what it was, we disagreed, a premature disclosure happened, <laughs> and then uh, somebody adjusted their policy. So things, things shifted to work a little better uh, together. Um, there are so many people in organizations with so many ideas, different business practices, different release cycles, we're not gonna get agreement. I'm not even gonna try to get, you know, what's the exact number of days. Uh, we, we surveyed a little bit and the average was in, in the 60 department, but that's, that's just what's actually happening and that's not, you know, that's not a good, a good number. Um, yeah, cert, cert right, we, write, we write 45 days. We almost never, almost never do 45 days. That's our, we couldn't get back. We didn't hear from the vendor in 45, so we'll drop 45 on you instead of uh, zero. Um, so it's a fun debate, I'm not sure how super useful it is to try to figure out what that embargo period should be. I think you're not gonna get agreement. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of vulnerabilities. There are too many to have to really almost care about individual ones. It's very fun too, don't get me wrong, I love it, sort of, but <laughs> there, there are so many, we need to just, it needs to be all this in part of process, not, hey, that specific thing that Tavis was yelling at Microsoft about on this day, it was like, everybody stop and pay attention to that. It's a, there, there's, there's more, more scale than that. Yeah, I'll just add that I think. Um, I, I'll just add that I think that um, re the reality is that a disclosure is a collaboration, and in any collaboration, there has to be some give and take. There has to be willingness to find common ground, and so that works provi provided that both sides are collaborating, right? So I think the reason that you set a timeline is exactly as Art said for the situations where people are not collaborating, when you're not getting a response and nothing's happening. But I think if you are getting a response, if you are finding that there is engagement, then the reality is to hold on to a deadline for just like because this is what our deadline is and we're gonna do it, is actually not putting the users first. It's not really sort of thinking about how you, it's not really thinking about the risk model in the big picture sense. And it also is not gonna create um, the, the trust and the benefit of the doubt between the parties that is going to lead to the best possible outcome. So we, like, just I'll just give you ours, and we work very closely with CERT. We push all our disclosures through CERT. We do a lot of disclosure, either for our own research or for members of the Mansfield community. So our published policy is we go to the vendor, we give them 15 days, and then we go to CERT, and we follow CERT's 45 days. So they get 60 days in total. But what typically happens is if there is engagement, then we talk to CERT, we talk to the vendor, and we agree on a timeline that makes sense. And it's normally less than 90 days, depending on the sector and how complex it is. But we are all agreed that we'll be flexible because at the end of the day, that's the best thing for the users, and that's what we care about. So would you say the complication is that? Would you say the specific complication there was just then Google and Microsoft not collaborating well yeah, together. absolutely, 100%. It was two big companies not willing to bow to each other. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the... Other yeah, right, right, right. Big yeah. <laughs> if you start with the framing that we all care about security, yeah. uh, then you can have the productive discussion where, you know, what about the shadow of the future? Well, if you say it takes a long time to fix it now, what about the next time? It, it helps unpack why people have the policies they do, and it lends itself to compromise. As long as you start saying, hey, this, this is about protecting people. Can I ask, do you, do you differentiate privacy and security somehow? Uh, I can refer you to the fifth chapter of my dissertation, <laughs> which was called Privacy Securing the Dynamics of Networked Information Sharing. Um, probably a little dated by now. Um, you, 
the uh, uh, it is right it, 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 flashbacks of trying to convince Harvard to allow me to Creative Commons it, but it was. Uh, <laughs> Um, so the, the challenge is, there are a couple of tensions there, which sometimes there really are concerns, especially because, oddly enough, we often have more privacy regulations than we have security regulations. And so you might have a vendor, in fact, when we were talking to companies initially as proposing this, uh, we had vendors say, listen, I have data, and I really want someone to tell me when that data is not secure. But if in the process of finding out that that data is not secure, they access that data, that triggers a compliance event that could cost me hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Uh, and so again, if our goal is to incentivize organizations to take security seriously and to work with those outside, that's where it gets to what can a researcher know about how they should engage the best co the companies, and that's something that we've tried to work with, of uh, bringing the company perspective in of how do what why don't they just engage and why why do they lawyer up so often, and often it's because they, there are real risks that they're worried about. Um, I think a lot of the work that we've done and the stakeholders have done is like to say, stand down, let's let's get the lawyers out of this and focus on security. You guys have thoughts on privacy? Just the, I think if you're talking about it in terms of disclosure, then it does change the game a little bit because if there has been a violation of, of privacy standards, then it's, it imposes a timeline. You know, there are state notification requirements and they have specific timelines, some of them. And so if you, as a researcher, have accidentally accessed PII or, or um, PHI, then, then that does change the game somewhat in terms of your disclosure and you need to be aware of what that is and the vendor will be aware of what it is. And the chances are, if you've done that, it will also change the vendor's response. Vendors tend to be much more sensitive to disclosures when it's going to trigger an action from them that has regulatory consequences. So um, that's just something to be mindful of. Yeah, the re reason why I'm asking, because I'm from Europe, and we are getting the new EU regulation in 2018, and yeah. it's uh, 72 hours to report it, so it's a quite tough thing. Yeah, it's very different. <laughs> the gentleman from this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, I'm going to do my disclaimer. Not, not my company's opinion, mine. Um, so as somebody who deals with insane amounts of PII, I actually think that it's one of the reasons that this is so important. Because if you have a defined process that researchers... So researchers are going to try, try and break into my shit anyway. If we have a process out there that at least sets some boundaries and some guidelines and bright lines that I can point to, and say, okay, if you want to try and break into my stuff for, for good reasons, then look at this. Because I can say then, okay, this set of stuff has PII in it, and if you're going to break into it, well, at least give me a heads up that you're going to try so that we can meet things like a 72-hour disclosure deadline. Because if you're breaking in and then you send me something and it's going to take me 72 hours to evaluate it, then it's too late for me. Right. Whereas if we set that expectation for security researchers up front, as part of a, a whole framework, then suddenly it makes my life on the PII side a hell of a lot easier. Right. So it's, it's not that the two are in competition, but particularly for those of us who store insane amounts of PII, they are actually intrinsically linked. Well, and, and you know, we talk a lot about best practices for vendors, but there are also best practices for researchers, and we as a community are allergic to that idea. We hate the idea of conformity of some kind, particularly the idea that that could come from vendors. That seems like the worst possible thing. I mean, God, we're in Nazi Germany, what's going on? And like, that's kind of a crazy thing for us to think. And so, you know, actually setting a baseline of like, you know, we were talking yesterday in the CFA session about weed, and I made a comment that ended up being like more contentious than I <laughs> wish it was, which is that whilst Weave, and, and I'm not going to go into it if you guys are not familiar with the case, you can Google it. Um, but uh, he, while it shouldn't set case law that um, what he did is a violation of the CFA, at the same time, the number of times that he accessed, or not him, but his buddy accessed um, the, inf the creds that they got, the, that they, they collected, that is not a proof of concept. A proof of concept is like two, three times. You don't need to do it 100,000 times, 200,000 times. And so I think it's completely fine for a vendor to say, hey, you know what, like, 
we're gonna make it so that you have to do this on a minimal level. If you do it more than that, I'm not gonna be as friendly as I would have been. For our colleagues in Europe, um, the Dutch have been uh, incredibly forward-leaning in thinking in, they, they still use the term responsible disclosure, which might be unfortunate. I don't think we're going to lose that term on the European side. Um, but on the other hand, what they've done has actually, they, they have national policy uh, all the way down to prosecutorial discretion, saying if a researcher you know, has engages in this behavior, avoids these things that, that are clearly bad, and is doing it with good intent, uh, then prosecutors have to stand down. And I think that's very powerful. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to, just to throw in here a bit. Um, <clears throat> the, so I, I also believe there are you know, there, a responsible ethical researcher guidelines. I mean, they're, they're, they're things researchers you know, probably, quote unquote, should follow. Um, more, I think, than, the, than just being told to conform. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I, sorry, I'm speaking of the choir up here, but um, <laughs> if there were such a guideline written down somewhere and published, uh, that can be used against a researcher to say, you fell outside of the guidelines, guess what? The you know, safe harbor's out, here comes every, every law we can throw at you. So the, the concern is you know, how, 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 how bright those lines are, and if that's out there, you're, you're, it can be flipped around on you, basically. So some, policy judo versus researchers is a, is a case study. Right. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, we advocate for like, yeah, the first time you get the PII, you got it, stop, right, and, and tell someone. And that indicates your intent of not downloading 100,000 people's stuff, just the one you got by accident. So. Other questions, comments, feedback? Ideas. Yes. How do we drive adoption? That's yeah. what we're here for. What do we do? Base, I could say like the FTC has a few cases that have said that companies that fail to have adequate uh, vulnerability disclosure processes possibly fall in the realm of um, unfairness counts again uh, on the FTC Act. Uh, so the recent Azus. A little clutter, yeah. Okay, so the recent like Azus case uh, was the router security case and part of that unfairness count included their failure to have an adequate vulnerability disclosure process. So outside of the uh, kind of regulated verticals, I think the FTC is trying to uh, kind of uh, make statements about vulnerability disclosure. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that the um, FTC's um, like sort of enforcement capabilities will, will, will over time drive a shift in culture. It, it's just gonna take a long time, whereas I think the vertical sector regulatory authorities will have a more direct short-term impact for those specific verticals. Sorry, but that's, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly, and the thing, and the problem is awareness. That's the challenge, is right. like, there is not good enough awareness. When you get the letter from them, you become aware. Right, right. But, ex <laughs> but, that, right. but is that how we want to do this? One company at a time. How many letters you got? Well, <laughs> it, 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 right, but at the, the very the least, it's a bit. It's it at least shows that there's a, a starting baseline. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm very. And you, you, you might you might get some traction out of the example, right? So right. every other crappy router vendor with no security yeah. now looks. Hey, Asus got lit up for this. Yeah. Maybe we should take some steps before we also get lit up because yeah. we do just as poor a job as they do. Yeah, I mean, I hope so for sure. Yeah. The idea. Other suggestions? How do we save the world? <laughs> save the cheerleader? No. Uh, such an old reference. Now. That was surprisingly dated. It didn't yeah. didn't know that oh, was that long. On, I'm yeah. always a little dated in my references. <laughs> Except when it's Archer. If you'd left it on the Archer slide, they'd be much more talkative. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go back to it now, aren't you? So who here? Oh, go ahead. No. I don't actually particularly have a question. I wanted to get Jen to expand a little bit more on the... On Archer? Because it does... No, Archer, does. obviously. That goes without <laughs> saying. Um, but the, the sort of change that the researcher's side needs to be cognizant of, because when you're talking about automobiles and installations in oil refineries, those are not things that fit a hard and fast 90 day. Completely agree. And even once you've gotten past the disclosure, 
you look at car, I mean, I can go buy a car today that has not had its airbag replaced or does not have all the modern safety stuff. So from the researcher side, we're in a totally new yeah. area where we can inadvertently put people at risk yeah. while following all the ethical rules. I, I agree. Like, I think it's the Wild West all over again. And I think what's interesting is that we've entered a sort of new um, point in the culture of the community. I kind of think of it as... Um, like sort of uh, the security community 2.0, which is terrible, but it's almost like, you know, we had our generation alpha and now we're in a in, in the sort of next generation and we've we've evolved or we've matured out from being from skiddies who were just curious and wanted to know how shit worked and test limits to suddenly being like people who are buying cars and putting our kids in them and going, holy shit, like there's actual implications with this stuff. And so I think, you know, a lot of the researchers I talk to feel the weight of that. They actually, you know, going back to that 15% caring about the money, a lot of the researchers I talk to are doing this because they want to save the world. Like, that's what it comes down to. They actually really care about the impact for Protect consumers. Yeah. yeah. And so, oh, thanks, Alan. Um, <laughs> Krieger is not a good, good example of this. He does not want to save the world. Um, and so I think, um, I think that, you know, that is difficult. Like, we are sort of making up as we go. As Josh said, like, we have to find the new paradigms of what that looks like. And even at Rapid7, that's a process we're going through right now, is as I said, we have this disclosure policy, it's been our disclosure policy for the five years I've worked at the company, and right now, we are internally looking at that going, we need to now have a category of, this is this, except when it comes to things that affect human life. And then it's gonna be like, what does that look like? How do we set timelines when you're dealing with cars? Right, it's a totally different paradigm. We have no clue what that looks like. But I think the only way to get there is to work together. And when I say work together, I don't just mean within the research community, although that, for sure, but we have to work with the automakers. We have to get to understand what their process is. We know what software development looks like. A lot of us have worked in software development. We don't know what automaking looks like. No clue. <laughs> so, and, and, like, and the same for medical devices. You know, we, we need to understand what that involves and the only way to do that is to work with them and have empathy for what they're going through. And if you approach that as, you know, you're the bad guys and I'm the good guys, you're never going to achieve anything. I said that the right way around, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes I'm a little self-hating when I say it the other way around. Um, yeah, so we, like, we really need to find that common ground. I think that's the first step. <laughs> I think I said do I get an award for that? <laughs> So uh, one thing that, that Art did not mention that, that uh, some of the, the, the smart people in his group have been thinking about is there will be instances when you will disagree on how to handle things. And that, doesn't, that still doesn't mean that it go back, goes back to the Wild West and we should have anarchy. There still are uh, some things that we can do to still have good practice in that case. Art, do you, can I put you on the spot to share some of the thoughts that you guys have had? <coughs> so this is this is disagreement. The the agree to disagree. How do you make that constructive? Um, well, you, you may not. I mean, it, it, it may come down to not agree. I mean, simply not agreeing. So the the Google Microsoft example. Google Google win, right? That happens. Um, sometimes one of the parties involves holds their ground. Is, is tired of waiting. Uh, values, puts different value on the impact of the vulnerability or the, the safety impact or the or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, chances of it being actually attacked in the wild, chances of an attack being successful, time to deploy fixes. Uh, are attackers gonna bother with a very complicated attack when phishing emails are still working? Um, what kind of attacker are you looking at? Broad opportunistic attackers or nation state targeted attacks? People have different opinions on all of those things and, and that can come down to how bad this, they think something is, which causes them to say, it's fine to disclose, disclose now or it must wait. Um, to, to some extent, the dumb answer is you have to accept you're gonna lose out sometimes, your opinion's not gonna carry the day uh, and be able to deal with that. You know, it's, it's, it's largely, if you have the information about the vulnerability, you generally legally have the ability to publish it, uh, at least in the US, and I'm not sure that's quite the same thing in, in, in the EU, but, um, you know, 
publishing details of a, of a bug is, is free speech in the U.S. Attacking someone with it is not, is, is typically uh, illegal. Um, so I don't know what to say really, except, I mean, it's certain, I'm trying to think of our cases. We accept that um, we will ask people, and we will ask nicely and repeatedly and make good arguments to do certain things, delay or extend or hurry up and publish or hurry up and get your fix out. Uh, and we try to not surprise people. You know, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna be the ones pulling the trigger, we will say, look, we're publishing in 24 hours. You know, we're not done, done negotiating. That's, that's gonna be our date. Um, so you can not surprise people and you can accept that you are not gonna win the negotiation every time. Um, you can negotiate, of course, and try to achieve consensus. I don't know that I've got any, any magic. That was, it was the, yeah. the not surprising and the okay. trying to negotiate with the things that I was, sorry about that. Yeah. No. lines of how to speed adoption or make it uh, more companies adopt, especially those companies outside of the technology industry, you need to actually take a step back and take one of those companies and have them look at this. This is terrifying to them. They've been making you know widgets for all of these years and all of a sudden you've got a bunch of crazy black hatters running at them, regulation coming everywhere, and actually making them understand that the security research community, we're not coming to get them. And obviously, as your survey shows, we're really not coming to get them. We're really trying to make a better, a better world. They're seeing the guy hacking an airplane. They're seeing, you know, these crazy people, you know, trying to free the world's information. They think we're uh, all making them under skates and yeah. Saying hi to Lana. yeah, making them understand that this this room, this is actually who's out there trying to help them, right. not hurt yeah. them. Th thank you, any media story with the picture of the scary looking. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, it's, mean, it's gone past Twitter. Like, I think I saw a mask recently. Yeah, I mean, how many people oh, type oh, wearing oh, a balaclava? I always do. I, I, <laughs> I actually can't see the keyboard properly without one. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think that there's fear on both sides. And the problem is fear makes people behave in um, irrational and defensive and awful ways. Suffering yeah. something. Right, right. And it also makes them stop Right, and empathy just completely breaks down. I agree. So who thought that what we said today was fairly common sense? So that's actually, this is, this is, this is rewarding, because I think that it means that this is not a contentious issue. Uh, who, who has worked with a uh, vendor before to, to actually say, hey, I found something? Got a couple hands. Okay. Has anyone been on the receiving side? More people. Uh, I won't put anyone on the spot, but is there anyone who's been on the receiving side who wants to share some experiences or react to what we've said today? <laughs> yes, and it's hard without a process at the, at the simplest level because there are people out there that want to do things and there are so many industries, not just my own, but others as well, that if there's not a process there, when you get a vulnerability and report into your customer service email address or something, yeah. and you have no idea what to do with it, and the company has no idea what to do with it. I worked in a company a number of years ago where I got an email about it because in my internal company profile thing, I had interest in vulnerability disclosure on it. And somebody had literally Googled on our internal portal and it came to me. Yeah. So that's where so many companies are. So w without the work that you guys are doing, it's hard. And we need to make it easier well, because then it becomes easier for everybody. I, I mean, the reality is that like people are super busy. They have processes of how they like to do things. Like generally, people are not bad people. They just they have things that they've been told. These are your priorities. These are your goals. And you're happily working away as an engineer, and you've got a delivery deadline. And you know that if that delivery deadline slips, then that has a high impact for the business, and that's a problem. And it has a high impact for the customer as well. And so when somebody comes to you and says, hey, we're gonna blow up your schedule, we're gonna divert you onto this other task and this thing that you thought you would dealt with ages ago, and it's gonna completely impact all your other work, like that's frustrating at best. 
and at worst, it's like it's it makes people insecure, it makes them anxious. It's difficult. There are no like people doing this stuff, or typically there are not a lot of people doing this stuff who are just meh about it. And we're the same. Like we get vulnerability disclosures, and you know there are times when I have to have a conversation with the software guys where I'm like, okay, you've done the patch. Have we put it out yet? And they're kind of like, oh, we have a release going out in a week, and I'm like, you don't get that we're a security company, right? And it's not like they don't care; they do. It's just that people have this whole thing of like, this is the process that we go through. We always do a release on a specific date, Microsoft Patch Tuesday. Like it's the same mentality, and so you you just that's how you think, and people don't like change very much. So when you're like, hey, we're going to do this completely different thing that you've not done, normally done, they kind of sit there scratching their heads. So for those of you who would like to engage further, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, please talk with Art, talk with Amanda and Jen, talk to me. Uh, tomorrow, the EFF is hosting an event to continue this discussion. Uh, I'm particularly proud of the fact that the EFF and the Department of Commerce have said, listen, this is something that we need to actually work together on. Uh, and 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 you know find some solutions that that work well for all involved. Uh, and I'm going to give a very quick plug. If you really like the idea of you know talking with other security people about processes, uh, our assistant secretary just announced our newest uh, multi-stakeholder process on IoT security, uh, and it's closely related to this. Uh, so the challenge is there's all sorts of smart consumer stuff out there. Uh, and not all of it is built for security. So how do we promote consumer awareness of security and how to reward manufacturer attention to security? We're going to be starting with aftermarket security, taking a page from our colleagues at the FDA, and saying, listen, patchability is important, but there's no real understanding of what it means for something to be patchable. So let's have a discussion around the technical definitions of patchability. Uh, and then figure out a way to condense that into a way that it can be easily communicated to the consumer. The consumer has something quickly to look for. Here are some small words that I can understand and look for in a package, but they are supported by a well-defined technical description that can be used to build standards or built to spec on. So trying to derive it from both the demand side and the supply side. Uh, and if you're interested in that, I'm very happy to talk further. So please engage. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. I'm guessing that you have a last word, because you always do. I know. I'm sorry. I really, I, I wanted to not in this case, but I just want to thank everyone who's participated in the process. Thank you very much. Here, here. And I want to thank the three people up here who have given a lot of work. They have well, their day jobs are, are far beyond what they already have time for, and this is something that is on top of that. Uh, and it works because people who care passionate about these issues get engaged. So please, I invite you to also get engaged. Thank you.